It's time to return to a galaxy far, far away to save or conquer it. In the new Star Wars The Deck Building game, you will take on the side of either the Rebel Forces or the Galactic Empire as you go head to head or 2v2 if you have another core set in this duel of cards. You'll be playing cards from your faction or maybe hire some neutral forces in order to try to take out your opponent's bases before they get yours. Do you have what it takes to shape this galaxy into a new future, be it under your deep control, or free for all those to explore? It's time for you to pick a side. So we got the game set up here, and if you're familiar with deck building games, you probably recognize most things here. The main deck, the lineup, which is referred to as the Galaxy Row, your personal deck, a pile of cards for you to purchase if nothing in the lineup works for you. It's going to work like a deck building game that you know and love. Now the point of this game is to defeat three of your opponent's planets before they defeat three of yours. You'll do this by buying stronger cards, gaining attack power, gaining supplies, and also controlling the force here. Now cards will be split in either the Imperial cards, Rebel cards, or Neutral cards. Depending on which team you're playing as, you'll only be able to add cards that are neutral or of your own team to your main deck, but you'll still be able to interact with your opponent's faction cards, which we'll get to when we talk about buying, bounty hunting, and sabotaging. On your turn, you'll play the cards from your hand, usually generating some assortment of three resources, attack, supply, and force. If we actually zoom in on the lineup here, we can actually see how the card shows what it will produce. Leia here produces all three with attack, supply, and force with a number of how much it produces, while this spy over here only produces two supply. They'll also have an ability here printed as well. You can activate that whenever you choose, so you don't need to trigger it as soon as you play the card. First, we're going to talk about supplies, as it's the one that basically acts the same as in every other deck builder. You'll generate supply using these yellow cubes to represent them, and you can spend them in order to purchase cards from the lineup to your discard pile. Any holes created from purchase will be immediately filled in the lineup. Next, we'll talk about force. That's this fun little tracker here. For every force you generate, you move the tracker towards your side. Now, if you start the turn with it all the way towards you, you get a free supply, meaning it's very useful for you to have it all the way in your direction. Finally, there's attack. Attack will have you destroy cards on the field, and it's also the way for you to defeat planets and win the game. Now, there are two places where you can send your attack, either to cards in the galaxy row or towards your opponent. You may have noticed that some of the cards are flipped strangely depending on how you're looking. Right now, you're viewing it more from the Rebel side, which is why the Rebel cards are face up for you while the Imperial ones are upside down. These boxes here are designed to be read for the opposite player, as they're only useful for when you decide to either bounty hunt or sabotage, depending on what team you're playing, but they're basically the same thing. You will choose cards with attack, sending them, at a card. So you cannot split up your attack. If something has, for example, 10 attack and you really want to destroy that interceptor that has three life, you got to send all 10 there. You can, if this card was enough to kill the interceptor, send this towards another card like your opponent or a different card on the board. For cards in the lineup, you need to meet or exceed the card's life. If you do, you will remove it from the board, gaining the resources in the box there and placing it in the main deck discard pile. Once you've gained the reward, fill the slot again with a new card. The other place you can send your damage and probably where you're gonna want to send damage is towards your opponent. That is how you win the game after all. Now, you can't just straight up attack the planet. These are where these capital ships, these horizontal ships come in, if they have any of these ships out, any damage you deal have to go through them first before they hit the planet. So right now, let's say that we had this simple three damage. We could only send three damage and not to the planet, though we could send three to this cruiser, taking it out. If there were no other capital ships in play, any damage would be sent to the planet. Unlike the cards in the galaxy row, any damage on the planet or the capital ships stays with them. So you don't need to do lethal damage right away. If we say we're to able to hit lethal damage on the planet, you are gonna take that planet card and add it to your victory pile, but basically it's three strikes. On the start of that player's turn whose planet was destroyed, they're gonna look through what planets they have left, choosing one to play 
and activating it. After you've played all your cards and spent the resources as you wish, you're going to discard any unit cards you have played. If you are able to have had a capital ship out, as in you just played it this turn or previous one, those stay out as they are safeguarding your planet until your opponent is able to deal lethal damage to them, in which case they'll go back in your discard, waiting until they're reshuffled into your deck to be replayed again. This is the gameplay loop and will go back and forth until one player has been declared the winner. So this doesn't have some fancy additional title, not Star Wars Rebellion or Star Wars Imperial Assault. This is simply Star Wars, the deck building game. And that's basically what it is. It's got all the classics of deck building, plus some other mechanics from other ones with Star Wars on top of it. All of it designed to be melded very well. This doesn't feel like a quick cash grab or like just put Luke on a card and we'll call it a day. It really feels like that they try to take some of the tried and true rules from other deck building games and make sure they sort of mix and fit very well with the Star Wars idea. This is a competitive deck builder and really designed to only go head to head. So they really designed that the Imperial cards should feel a bit more Imperial and give the Rebel cards a distinct feeling so you don't feel like you're just playing as the Imperials with a red coat of paint on them. Because of that, you're going to have a bit more of an asymmetrical gameplay style, which is actually pretty fun at the table. The Rebels are actually going to try to make the Imperial discard cards more. They're more about sort of sabotaging all their little plans, while the Imperial army is going to really focus on on drawing more cards, just having a lot more resources, and maybe taking a bit more control over the galaxy world. They have a lot more cards that let just straight up remove cards from there. So maybe denying a specific card for the rebel army outside of the usual sabotage or the bounty hunting. And of course, you know, some of those neutral characters, in particular Jabba the Hutt, are going to be very helpful for you. Now, in terms of actually gameplay mechanics, I will say it doesn't bring anything actually new to the table. It does a lot that we've seen in other deck building games. In fact, a lot of the discourse I see around it is people saying like, oh, it's like this game. It's like this game. That said, what it does do very well is taking those little bits and cool rules from other deck builders and sort of just mixing them and smoothing them out all together in a really nice combination. This is a game that really flows really well, not just in the gameplay mechanics, but the rules and the ways the cards are written and designed work fantastically well. And to show that, I'm going to actually compare it to the game at least I thought the most of, and that's the Power Rangers deck building game. This is because not only are both of those head-to-head -head games when each player takes a different side from the property and they play differently depending on how that sort of works in the show, but they're based on heavily on properties. That is where some of the enjoyment is going to be is if you're a fan of Star Wars or, in the other case, the fan of Power Rangers. Now, looking at the cards, the art is just cleaner. It's, they obviously have like, here's our gallery. We have Luke shots. We have nice pieces of Luke. These are designed to fit in a card game or whatever. I'm actually pretty sure most of the ships come from the X-Wing game. So they're already designed for that. While the Power Rangers ones feels like they were pulled from comic panels to fit whatever they needed. The other thing goes to how both these are designed to battle and how someone else can take out the opposing player's cards. In this one, the idea being that you're head-to-head, -head, so you're across the table, they actually have the part that's relevant for the other side upside down. So if you want to think like, mm, do I want to blow up this TIE fighter? Well, you can see what your reward is and how much it costs. For the Imperial side, it is upside down because that doesn't really matter to you as much. I mean, yes, maybe you want to make sure an opponent doesn't get a certain reward, but it's not the thing that really is going to help your deck, so to speak. Power Ranger one, on the other hand, they're all written on the same way, so there is a bit more, you might have to just double check what it means, if it's a symbol, if it's upside down, a little small print. And it's those kind of small things that really do help this one shine a bit more when you just take a look at them side by side visually. That said, this smoothness and ease into the rules does come with some drawbacks. One, there isn't anything new or interesting to hook players who are already really invested and played a lot of deck building games. And... They don't seem to take any risks with the stuff either. The Force thing is sort of new. You could argue you've seen that in other ones. And there are cards that can feel really strong if you have the Force on your side. But it wasn't something that I feel it was a desperate grab for. What usually happened was one player got it, a lot of Force cards. And then the other player was just like, all right, maybe I'll make sure you don't get that bonus one. But I'm not going to be able to pull too much to my side. So they never really tried to push 
want the game mechanics to a whole new area, they really tried to keep it sort of in the safe bounds. And because of that, they also didn't really try to fix any of the common mistakes that happened in deck building. More than once did a game snowball really fast. That kind of snowballing is something I see a lot more, especially in the earlier deck building games. And the fact it can happen here is a little disappointing. And the other thing is you still can get those turns. It's this one they fix a little bit, but we had times when someone would get their all their attack cards when their opponent's planet only had two life and they didn't have any ships. So it's like, well, uh, this is the time when I could have killed you if you had your new planet, but it didn't get through. So I wish they tried to take more risks with the cards, but unfortunately, this is a very safe deck builder. And going back to the Power Rangers one, I do feel like while it has some hiccups here and here, we actually played it right after the Star Wars one. And I did realize a few things that I really wish the Star Wars one would push. Both are asymmetrical, but the Star Wars one is pretty much, if you're rebels, make your opponent discard. There's really no other plan, just keep killing the same things. Imperial, buy and attack them as quickly as you can. It doesn't feel like that depending on certain cards, you're not gonna change your strategy. While the Power Ranger one, on the other hand, yes, you're still trying to do that, but I felt like there were a lot more weird decisions I had to think. For example, depending on the large card I'm playing with, which is a bit more similar to, for example, the DC deck builder, I might not care about a certain type of card as much. Hell, certain guys can't even use things like a maneuver equipment because they don't have slots for them. You can get the energy, the money, so to speak, from the game, but you can't use the ability unless it slots into your card. Also, its asymmetricalness definitely goes a bit farther when it comes to the Zors versus the Master cards and things like that. And in the Power Rangers one, one thing I really like, and I wish the Star Wars had, was at the end of your turn, you actually take damage for each of your opponent's cards in the lineup. So for both sides, it becomes this, do I buy this card that's good for me or leave in the lineup because it's hard for them to take out and I can start keep doing that chip damage and vice versa. Like, I want to buy that card, but there's too many of your my opponent's cards in the lineup. I got to knock a few of them out. It became a bit more questionable when the Stars won. It usually was, yeah, I'll just take out the thing. It just felt like the, the Power Rangers one I was thinking and had to make, uh, uh, do I go p down path A or B, depending on what my deck build needs me to go down or what the lineup when the Star Wars one feels you know what you're going to do after a few games. This is how the Imperial plays. This is how the Rebel plays. Go to it and see who can complete their strategy faster. What I'm trying to get at by comparing these two games is the Power Rangers one, it's a bit more rough around the edges. Definitely doesn't look as good. And the rulebook I'll admit is definitely a lot worse than the Star Wars one. But I feel it also offers a lot more gameplay moments and strategies. While the Star Wars one really likes to play it safe. It doesn't do anything new, does them all really well. But because it doesn't try to push the envelope or bring in something really wild or crazy, nothing that really shifts the game, it really does come down to the two forces having the same strategy going head to head and just seeing who can do theirs better. And that isn't a terrible thing. There are plenty of games where technically you're not adding new strategies or variants and stuff. I mean, the classic chess that uses the same pieces and it's considered one of the best board games of all time, so to speak. And that's why it's not a bad thing, especially for Star Wars fans who are new. Because in particular, you know, if you try to look at best Star Wars games, you might actually end up with Star Wars Rebellion. It's fantastic and probably will still be considered the best Star Wars board game, especially on Board Game Geek but it's definitely not the one I would suggest someone new to board games to pick up. So this makes for a great spot in the line of Star Wars board games. But if you're not looking at it from a Star Wars point of view and more from a deck building point of view, it's not terrible, but it isn't going to be the one that I think breaks into the top charts without that Star Wars theme. Crits and misses for Star Wars, the deck building game. Crits. A lot of thought was put into the format and layout of this game, but not just for the cards, for the rule book as well. It is quick, easy to learn, and easy to understand what the cards do, who they're for, and what part is important to you. This seems like a small thing that maybe is overlooked at times, but for me, this is a game that really nails making it a legible, understandable game. This is a head-to-head -head game, and you're not just picking up any old card. If you're playing the Rebels, you're gonna get Rebel cards. Same thing for the Empire. 
I like that they designed it so specifically the Rebel cards go to the Rebel player and have mechanics that are really exclusive for the Rebel side. Same thing for the Imperial side. So you do feel and understand like, okay, this card plays as Imperial while this one plays as Rebel. And then the neutral cards then add a boon to both sides and maybe pull a little bit from each side in terms of their mechanics if they maybe swayed a bit more one way or the other in the Star Wars lore. This doesn't feel like a hodgepodge of just grabbing what people saying are hot and putting it in there. It felt like the extra work, just like I mentioned earlier in the formatting and the rules, were designed to add those extra rules so they all fit together, they made sense, the head head combat and killing the opponent's cards. This is a game that will play well and none of the rules will ever feel too janky or broken. I think it's a very smooth gameplay experience all around. Misses. It doesn't bring many things new to deck building, and while that isn't a sin in and of itself, the problem also comes along, it doesn't do anything to try to fix the problems of deck building. Snowballing is still an issue in this game, and there will be moments when you get a full hand of useless cards because you don't want to buy anything more and you happen to get your heavy supply hand, or vice versa, you get a lot of attack, in that moment there isn't much to attack in the galaxy row, or your opponent's base is already about to explode, so you're not really going to get an advantage for throwing 15 damage at a planet that has two life left. You aren't going to be playing a large card to represent a specific character or choosing a specific sub-faction of said faction. You will either be playing Rebels or the Empire. And while the asymmetrical nature of each side was really cool and was a crit, the thing is, you're going to learn it and get used to it after a few playthroughs. They're not going to play differently right now. You just have the same main deck every time. And until expansions are made and add some new things, you're basically going to know how the Empire is supposed to play, how the Rebels are supposed to play, and how you're basically just going to do the same things over and over and hope that you are able to do it better or faster than your opponent. Before I continue, I do want to point out one more thing that's a bit of a crit for me but I didn't think it was worth putting on the crits and misplace in terms of what other people think. And that is the size of this box. They easily could have gotten away with a 12 by 12 box and no one would have batted and I'd just be happy about a Star Wars deck building game. But they made a smaller one and it's probably gonna get a bit tight. You probably have to remove the insert if they add expansions and want things sleeved. But I still appreciate the smaller box as it makes it easier and more travel able and makes it the kind of game that I'm more excited to bring around as I don't have to lug a huge thing and worry about damaging the box, even if only 20% of that box is filled. So thank you for choosing the smaller box. But in terms of the gameplay, I may have harped on how simplified it is and how it gets boring and not really too many advanced strategies going on there, but that's okay. You know, this is, especially for something like Star Wars, this is going to be a game that is going to appear on big box shelves and people are going to try and pick it up. Be able to actually learn the cards, read the cards, read the rules in a very clear and concise way. And the art's very pretty. It's going to be very attractive to see. It does, that smoothness does work out here. And I think when people start comparing this game with other Star Wars licensed games, it will do a great job. I think it's going to be one that people will always enjoy partially because it is very easier to bring out to table when you're like, mm, yeah, you know, let's just take this game out. It's not a, a hard experience and you have to set up and learn this whole new rule set. Well, at the same time, you're going to get a good Star Wars game. And I think that is a safe bet. However, if Star Wars isn't as much your thing and maybe you've played a lot of deck builders, I don't know if this one will make as many lists or at least rank as high. It pulls from many other ones and some of them may have a bit more janky rule sets or problems, but I think they tried to push the envelope in a way that will be a bit more endearing or at least change things up and make people more excited to try and see what weird things go on there. Now, I say that because expansions could fix a lot of the problems Star Wars has here. That may be how you add some variants, maybe add change the way they play and be more heavily focused on troops or spying, what have you. That is my thoughts on the Star Wars deck building game. Let me know your thoughts. Is this one that you think is going to be your favorite deck builder of all time? Or is this just you're more happy to have another great Star Wars game? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I can't wait to hear from you. And of course, a like, share, subscribe would always be super helpful. But for now, I'm Will, and this has been a Roll for Crit Review.